Boss, it's a pleasure to see you after almost a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, I was excited to see your name on this Quest for Consonance uh, Theology and the Natural Sciences Conference. I attended your lecture. Uh, and I, I really want to begin by talking about it, by understanding the importance of critical realism in this whole science theology debate and understanding, and particularly Ernan McMullen's uh, mm -hmm. approach to it. Well, Ernan's realism was a very nuanced, uh, sophisticated form of realism, um, a scientific realism, but um, quite different from uh, much that you would find in the literature on the side of the scientific realists. Um, and uh, I began to appreciate that very much over the years as he and I talked and argued. <laughs> So yeah. w what are some specific characteristics of Ernan's uh, critical realism in science that may be different from other realists, all of whom you battle, I know, but what characterized Ernan's sophisticated, nuanced approach mm. compared to others? Well, maybe I should start then with uh, what I had at the end of the lecture, which is that uh, in his writing about science, he gives a big role to metaphor, to imagination, yeah. to uh, the resources that a model may have uh, that would confront its own failure yeah. in a way that he sees uh, uh, the kind of resources that he sees in poetry. Oh. So that's, that's, that's a pretty radical approach for, yes, for, for science. Yes, absolutely. And that that enriches his uh, I think very much, very much so. You know, uh, he began uh, with this at the end of the eight, of the sixties. That's exactly when philosophers of science were s switching from theories to models in oh. their focus, uh -huh. and he was one of the first ones to do this. Oh. Um, he gave a, a talk at an international conference where he analyzed the Bohr model of the atom, but exactly showing how this already, although it was not right. It had resources in the model itself that could be exploited by Heisenberg so as to mm. create a totally new picture mm. uh, to overcome the failings of that very mm. model. Mm. Uh, you use the term that uh, to explain Ernan's uh, uh, position on critical realism as retroduction. Retroduction. Um, right. Yeah, that, that's not an, uh, an everyday term, so no, it's help not. me understand right. yeah. what that means. Well, he got the term from Charles Sanders Peirce, mm -hmm. um, and um, what he means by it is the form of inference that according to him, according to, Mer to Ernan, drives science, that makes science, as he said. Um, he comes to it after a long historical journey. He begins with Aristotle. Aristotle was always a shining light for Ernan, but what he begins with is a bit of a problem that he sees in Aristotle. Aristotle, in his theory of science, had two sides. One is, what science is meant to do if, is give you an absolutely certain demonstration of th why things act, why they behave the way that, why they have to behave the way they do. Um, and in giving his explanations, he has to and does uh, refer to unobservable things, things to which there are yeah. no access. Yeah. But when he outlines his epistemology, also in the posterior analytics, uh, the form of inference that Aristotle has is just inference and abstraction, a kind of generalization from the level of perception. And that would never get you to any conclusions about the unobservable. Right, right. This he sees as the the problem, the yeah. problem that had to be overcome. Yeah. Because for his realism, he has to get to the unobservable. Exactly. Yeah. You, you don't care. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I'm being silly. I mean, I, not think, in the same way. Yeah. Not in the same <laughs> right. way. Right. Yeah. So why yeah. is that important to Ernan in his critical realism to get to the unobservable? It is part of his realism that, um, and he sees this as a, a clear dividing line, that for the realist, the inference that makes science gives a warrant for the assertion of the reality of those theoretical entities that were postulated, oh. even if we have no direct access to them. Mm. Yeah. Now, the process of science is, we generally think of as an induction. It's not a deduction. It's not mm. logic. It's not formal logic that you mm. have your premises mm. and go back. You're looking at obs observations and making inferences to the, to the best explanation and then testing those and falsification. So, uh, you know, draw out uh, from Ernan's 
a point of view what the process of science would, would actually look like given his philosophical orientation. Yeah. Well, what you said, he would agree with in general, in a general outline, but of course the devil is in the details, mm -hmm. right? And as, uh, <clears throat> as philosophers and scientists over this 2,000 year history that Ern um, goes through, uh, try to make clear what exactly is this inference, uh -huh. um, they don't somehow bridge the gap that Aristotle left us with. Um, Deduction is not sufficient, induction is not sufficient, inference to the best explanation, Vernon says, that's an easily criticized idea. So he's not going to just stay with that. Mm. What he eventually arrives at, retroduction, is still a process of inference, but crucially, it involves the introduction of new concepts, revolutionary changes in the conceptual approach to the subject. And that is what allows him to bridge the gap. Oh, so the difference between ordinary induction mm. and retroduction, retroduction mm -hmm. is this introduction of new... Now, does that occur every time you are doing science, or does that occur only in paradigm shifts? Not just in paradigm shifts, but also not just every day. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, every day statistical analysis is yeah, something yeah, yeah, yeah. that is learned and is, uh, right. it follows a recipe. But, but if you're going to try to find those unobservable entities that right. are the, the real thing in itself, right. you, you have to be able to add that the new right. concepts to the induction. That's right. There's a, a, a crucial change in the concepts uh, before that can happen. Okay. And, um, of course, Erdman has wonderful examples. I mean, um, when Einstein introduces relativity, the concept of simultaneity, which was so basic. Assumed, yeah. Yeah, no, it gives way, it disappears, it, it has to give way to a different concept. And you need that to get the reality of what space-time and general relativity would suggest exactly. about gravity and all of that. Exactly. And it'd be impossible to get to that reality unless you, you made that conceptual change. So right. That makes a lot of right. sense. But now, let, let me get to your point of view, because yeah. now that we've made a lot of sense out of this, mm -hmm. you critique it. You, yes. you have a constructive yeah. empiricism, yes. which basically says, I think, and you'll correct me, mm -hmm. that you really can never get to that unobservable. Well, I say that it is not actually part of the aim of science to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so. I see the first difference between the scientific realist and the empiricist that they have that they claim, that they see different criteria of success in science. Okay. The realist says the criterion of success is truth, um, and to believe to accept the theory that will have to involve believing that it is true and that the things that it talks about are there, right, including the unobservable. Uh, the empiricist says. No, the aim of science is to construct empirically adequate theories, and the bottom line is empirical success, so that uh, the construction of models that may have in the model all kinds of things that correspond to nothing, <laughs> um, but, it, but are models that the phenomena can fit, so that they allow us to predict and manipulate, that is the success that is looked for. And, and that, that's, in one sense, a lower bar. Yes. It's a lower bar, yes. but from your point of view, it's a bar that can be achieved. And the yes. other higher bar uh, right. is, it, from your point of view, it's in, impossible in principle or just impossible technologically at the current time? Um, no, I think there's an, uh, an impossibility in principle here. So that's a very significant difference. Yes, In terms is. of our understanding of the whole world, much even more so science. Well, it's... For me, it is a different understanding of the enterprise of science. Mm -hmm. Now, um, scientists uh, have had th themselves different opinions about this. Um, of course, the working scientist immerses himself in the picture that he's working with. And it almost and doesn't matter. It doesn't, right. And he will speak as a, the way scientific realists love, you know, <laughs> right, of course. But um, nevertheless, if you uh, look at the more philosophical writings of uh, more philosophical scientists, um, Mach, uh, Planck, um, Hermann Weil is somebody I really admire. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I follow him also in some philosophical uh, issues. They don't speak about it that way. The way they speak about it is that um, the scientist constructs models 
these models are beautiful abstract structures, mathematical structures. That's what mathematics mm -hmm. allows us to do. And the success consists in the fact that we can see the phenomena having a place in these models mm -hmm. in such a way that we get an overview of relations between the mm -hmm. phenomena and then we can, as I say, predict and manipulate. Mm -hmm. So this is a way of seeing science rather than seeing the world. Your um, name of constructive empiricism, I yeah. certainly understand empiricism is what you're describing, yeah. but w when you add the uh, adjectival um, description of constructivist, mm -hmm. what does that mean? What does that add to empiricism? Okay, it doesn't refer to the social constructionist, not yeah. at all, okay? No, it refers to uh, the idea that what the scientist is doing is constructing. He's not inferring, he's constructing. Uh -huh. He's constructing models. Nancy Cartwright has a, a wonderful phrase, nomological machines <laughs> that can eventually be taken out of the laboratory and set to work in the world, <laughs> right? But it begins with the construction of mathematical models. And um, that's what the word constructive refers to. Yeah.